Um, uh, today's our second Teos seminar of the of the semester, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Julia Hathaway, who comes to us from the U.S. Environmental Protections Agency (EPA) down there in in Washington D.C. And just to give a little bit of background. Uh, she actually leads the Clean Air and Power Division's Communication and Engagement Program to advance the Office of Atmospheric Protection's vision for the energy transition. Uh, uh, a little bit about her past, she earned her Master of Environmental Management at the Yale School of the Environment and then got her PhD at George Mason University. And it should be mentioned that uh, you know, while before she got her PhD, she actually served as uh, congressional staff for the Florida for a Florida congressman and then senator, and then later returned to Capitol Hill as legislative staff for the Committee of Natural Resources. And so, in addition to working uh, in some of the federal agencies for advocacy and so forth, she actually yeah. launched and led uh, a couple grassroots environmental justice campaigns uh, in the state of Florida. So. As you'll hear about today, uh, her work strives to address gaps in understanding of communication factors that impede or enhance scientific knowledge making and the use of that knowledge. Um, just as a little personal note, I've known Julia for several years now uh, and have collaborated with her on a couple projects and it's and it's been amazing. Myself as a background and going into this was just in plain old weather uh, and weather forecasting. And she has uh, really enlightened me on the social science side and has taught me a lot uh, of linking some of what I do to the social sciences. So I've been very grateful for her over the years in doing that. And so and so hopefully you'll get to enjoy some of the things that, uh, that uh, she's working on as well. So Julia, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Um, oh, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. And and Brian no longer redlines out my theory. So we've come a long way. <laughs> yeah. Good point. <laughs> um, so thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, this presentation is in several parts, but the most important parts really involve a bunch of people who are here in this meeting. And that's the interdisciplinary team that Brian um, leads and and the team is wonderful and he puts up with a lot from us. So we we appreciate him very much. But the um, the overall frame for this is that we have complex problems and that's nothing new, but we are increasingly coming to understand that complex environmental problems have both scientific, a scientific and social ecological dimensions. And one thing that has arisen fairly recently is a true appreciation, appreciation for equity and the fact that issues are not always well understood in context. People have a lot going on and they're bringing all these things to their everyday and they're bringing these things to um, decision-making contexts. And, and we don't don't always see what other people have going on and we don't really always understand why it matters. So um, I mentioned the team, 11 folks are on the team and um, we meet regularly. Joseph is our rock star student. Dominic is joining the team. And um, we all agree that really collaborative approaches are needed to try to, to grapple with these problems which are truly complex and, and multifaceted and they, they interact with each other. So um, we have an opportunity to really try some new and cool things, which we have been doing. And for me, just you know, to bring my particular lens, I'm really interested in how these collaborators can happen, but how they can happen in participatory ways. So stakeholders can teach us a lot and um, how to do that in a way that works is really complicated and really challenging. But we've come a long way there too. So, um, and then of course, I, I wanna talk about the, the team's project and um, I'm uh, really gonna appreciate members of the team jumping in if I miss something or um, in general, you know, I don't think that this presentation is gonna take but maybe half hour. And so 
I would invite you to um, just, if I can't see your hand, because I'm, I'm looking at the screen or whatever, somebody just speak up because, you know, this, this is best when it's conversation. And when, um, when I interrupt somebody, I feel terrible about it. But when somebody interrupts me, I'm like, oh no, that's conversation. So let's, let's approach it in that light. Okay. So the, the context for this for me, and it changes from week to week, depending on what we're working on, but it's all about, for me, communication. And I have an undergraduate degree in communication back when it was not well, okay, I'm just going to say it, not really well applied. And I struggled with that, but it's come a long way. That said, it's still not terribly intuitive to many people what we're talking about when we're talking about study and communication with the big C. Um, and uh, my my doctoral advisor, Kathy Rohn, who, who can't be here today, but she has had um, my back on a bunch of stuff and she's she's helped my mind so much and my heart get into the work that I have to really give her credit for this quote. Um, there's these uh, gentlemen from the University of Illinois and they said, well, you know, studying communication is not easy. It's, it's like asking fish to study the water they swim in. And that's not, that's not, you know, far from the truth in a lot of cases. We communicate every day, right? Um, but when you talk about communication science, we're really talking about something much more methodical and rigorous. And, and you know, the word science connotes everything that we all associate with it. You know, we want to understand things. We want to understand what's connecting A and B. We want to understand the why. And we want to understand what we can do with that. The why is important. For me, it means trying to break through some of these really protracted issues that seem to be piling up. And um, yeah, it applies to all of our sciences. And um, it really is a matter of addressing the people in, in the equation. And then, you know, of course, as I alluded, we need diverse knowledges and plural pathways. And uh, the how for me is engaged research. I have um, a lot to learn in this respect because the literature is just growing by leaps and bounds and it's wonderful and difficult to keep up. But coming from a professional history that, that Brian described, I'm really, really interested and how we can better apply what we know because we need to. Okay, the story. I start with a story because um, I learned a lot at the Alda Center and stories are good. Um, I think it's probably your story too. I have this particular background. I have learned that it's complicated and it takes everybody working together. It takes all of us networked, collaborative, in trying to bring strategic approaches to bear. And then I found out, well, you know what? <laughs> it takes more training. I mean, I, I did get the sort of environmental man management training I needed um, a couple decades ago, and I really benefited from it. But there were still some really important questions that just really bugged me and really drove me. And I'm like, okay, time to dig back in. So yeah. And this is it. This is this is it. Working together means addressing human problems where the science matters and addressing scientific and technological challenges where social influences and impacts must be considered. All right. I think our project is an excellent example of this. Not surprisingly, here's the team. We have Brian. We're very, very lucky to have Brian. And then we have Ebath. Um, Saeed, I don't know if he's on the call or not. Uh, he and Ari are, um, are folks who help us bring the visualization to bear in this project. Susan, thank you so much for making the time. Um, I learned so much from Susan. Shadia, I don't think is here. And Elizabeth, Liz Westerhoff is um, the, the author of our narrative, which I'll get into in a second. Um, I'm at 
EPA, and um, I'm trying to bring social science approaches there too. It's a process. Um, Abby is in Australia. She still makes our meetings when she can. So I mentioned Kathy and I mentioned Joseph, and this is the team. And we're just, everybody's wonderful to work with. So the project is about understanding why people may not make the best decisions when they need to make good decisions. And you guys, I see that my internet is unstable. So just tell me if you have a problem hearing me. That's really annoying. Um, it it is cutting like on and off a outside. little bit, Julia. Okay. So, so maybe you, you may have to shut off your video. Of your, okay, let's do that. And, and yeah, that's, that's fine. Start. I don't want to yeah. see myself anyway. Huh, okay, thanks, Joseph. All right. Um, you know, it's again, stepping back for a second, I think that every one of us here has had a frustration or two where we was just sort of said, I don't know why people don't do X or Y or Z. And that applies here. We live in an era of climate change where we're seeing increasing and, and, and accelerating impacts. And, um, you know, we're seeing severe weather. Um, thanks, Dominic. The, uh, the issue here is, you know, sometimes people do what they need to do for themselves and sometimes they don't. And increasingly they're, there is a need to, to engage with these questions. So how do we bring the amazing science to bear in ways that people are going to listen to and act upon? How we do that is really tough because there's obviously a rich literature about how people respond to risks and how they don't, and it includes a number of different factors. It's you know cognitive, it's cultural. People may not have money to put gas in the car to leave. And then political factors, I, mean, I don't wanna go there, but there are plenty of those. So understanding these factors on top of the to people in a timely way is, is really important. So how do we encourage people to prepare and take, you know, take it seriously? The tools we have are great, but I don't think that we would say that the tools that we have are enough. The point is information is great, but information alone may not be adequate to get people to do what they need to do. And we've known this a long time. You know, this Simis paper is about, um, it's called the lure of rationality. People are not rational thinkers. I mean, as much as we'd like to think that we are, we're not, we have a lot going on. And so, you know, moving to the questions at hand, you can dive into the literature and you can find a whole bunch of different interesting things that can influence how you might try to make things better. And so this is what the team did. And we came back to the fact that there's a strong scientific basis for engaging emotions. The psychometric approach to risk arose because people are not acting rationally on, for in, on information that they are receiving about science-based risks. You know, a really good example of this is um, nuclear power. You know, I I do believe that we don't pay enough attention to the fact that we don't have a Yucca Mountain. We we have spent rods in storage. This is this is real. But when you step back and you talk about the danger and the risk associated with nuclear energy production, people have a really outsized and and sort of not quite 
quite right sense of what that risk is like. So, you know, apart from your views on this, and I realize that's a really complicated issue, that's just an example. People have, um, you know, people get terrified of certain things and then they just don't, It, you know, a real risk may not catch on. We dug deeper and we said, well, what are ways that you can engage people at an emotional level? And we came up with three, basically. And I'll dig into these more. But narrative, I think everybody knows that narrative is a very powerful tool. Not everybody may know what the evidence base is for that. Basically, we process information differently when it's delivered in narrative. You know, think about the difference between reading a novel and, or or seeing a documentary and reading a text. You know, it's it's very, very different. And, and we keep it and we process it and it makes a bigger and deeper impact on occasion. Then you have visual strategies. And for this, we we had great capacity. Um, folks like, like Brian, like Ari, like Saeed, other folks who um, have been a part of this project work on the reality deck and have been um, really committed to visual strategies. When we see basically um, visual strategies that are a little bit more abstract, like the Kona of uncertainty, for example, yeah, we get it, it makes an impact, but does it make us act? And so we started talking about and researching who has used visual, visual strategies for what, and to what effect and with what success. And then the third bit is what is called milling. And this, this idea has been around for a long time, obviously, 57. But if you've ever had the experience of, you know, okay, let's talk about, I don't, I think you guys got hit with a wildfire smoke last year. It was pretty scary here. We were told not to go outside. It was an unprecedented risk to go outside. And so I found myself and other people saying, well, what does this mean? How should we understand this? Are you crazy enough to go for a run? Don't do it. So this is a phenomenon known as milling. And so when you engage somebody at an emotional level and they are maybe uncertain or puzzled or, you know, they're, they're rendered sort of, um, it, it disrupts your sense of everything's fine. <clears throat> That's actually a good thing. But in addition to understanding that you know, on a cognitive or sort of a, an intellectual level, okay, this is what I'm being told. This is what people are trying to communicate with me about this, this risk. People need opportunities for talking about responses. And this is held true in the literature too. When, you know, there's a fire in the building, people need to say, oh, are, are you walking out now? Or, you know, is it over there? Or, you know, this sort of thing. And that's milling. So the workshop, here's how we put these constructs and this theory, and um, we put a method together that was, I think, pretty cool. We were dealing with certain constraints. This was during the pandemic. And so it was not possible to bring people together in one space, which would have you know, been ideal. But in other respects, it turned out to be it spurred some creativity. So we had a four, four hour online workshop with college students from across the country. There were over 160 of them and they stuck with us for, for the entire day. And we all lived to tell. And it was actually very fun. It was a great learning experience. And of course, you know, there are lessons learned about how to do this kind of thing. There are also lessons learned about how these approaches work, don't work, where's the promise, what can we turn to next in our thinking? So 
it had these three features and I'll dig into them one by one. First of all, I mentioned Liz and her great narrative. We all put our minds together and we talked about, well, well who, who is part of a campus community? And we came up with, up with, of course, students, of course, staff, university staff, um, people who work for the university who do you know, facilities management. And then we thought a little bit deeper and we thought, well, you know, what kinds of students? And maybe this student is an RA. Maybe this person has a health condition that nobody knows about because they prefer to keep it quiet. It's a personal matter. But when a storm is arriving, that person is kind of struggling with some unseen factors that maybe are causing conflict. Do I stay? When can I go? How do I weight these, these sort of criteria for making a good decision here? And how do I be responsible to myself and others? So there were a lot of these characters. And um, in the next couple of slides, I'll use one of the students named Hunter as an example. So they listen to this narrative about a fictitious storm barreling down on the campus over a series of days. And they listen from the perspective of their assigned character. And they got a character brief before the workshop so that they could sit with it and say, oh, okay, here's the perspective I'm taking for this, this exercise. And then we did a between group comparison relative to the visualizations. Half of the students saw standard weather forecasting graphics and Joseph was our, our student meteorologist. And um, in between snippets of narrative saying, here's what's going on now, there was a, a, a forecast saying, here's what we understand, here's what we advise. and basically gave everybody their considerations for making their own best decisions. So half saw that and half in addition saw um, 3D computer graphics visualizations. And I'll show you those in a sec. And then third, thank you, Susan, who, who came upon this really interesting tool that's been around for a while. Something called the ethical matrix was brought into play here. We had um, everybody role play, of course, their, perfect, their perspective as a certain character and, and engage in deliberation using this thing called the ethical matrix. The ethical matrix has been used, it originated in the UK. And I think that the original focus of it was um, animal welfare and other um, sort of agricultural and um, and, uh, and, and production issues. Um, the, the example that they might use is um, BST. Is it okay to have cows being made to produce more milk, even if it causes them health impacts and doesn't do anything for an already, you know, <laughs> that we're, we're giving it away under USDA programs? So the ethical matrix is a tool that brings everybody together and you participate in a two-part process where you bring your own perspectives as that character to bear. Your lived experience is brought to a group decision-making process. And I'm just hoping you guys can hear me because I keep seeing my, my internet is unstable. This is the timeline. You get a sense of um, the fact that there, there was a, a process to the narrative. The hurricane is approaching. People are getting more and more concerned and trying to figure out, well, what do I do? And at times before and during and after the narrative and their experience, we had survey questions. And the survey questions ask people about their perceptions of risk, their state of worry um, for themselves and others, 
and what their intentions were relative to taking protective action like, well, um, you know, beforehand, would you buy insurance if you owned a home or, or would you bring in some supplies, that kind of thing? But also, um, would you evacuate when it comes down to it? And everybody has different considerations. This slide is just to give you a sense of how the narration went. It starts off really sunny, excuse the pun, and people are just coming back and they're seeing friends and they're figuring out where their classes are. And then the news arrives that we have a hurricane approaching. And it proceeds from there. I mentioned Hunter. This is the beginning of the character description that we provided participants for Hunter. So of those 160 participants, they were given um, their character profiles and there were, I believe, six of them. So we had a number of hunters. We had a number of, of people who were RAs. We had a number of people who played the provost. And the first step was to get a hold of your character. And so they went to a breakout group and, and talked about what their character, who that character is and what their concerns are. So for Hunter's situation, again, unseen challenges. Hunter does not come from privilege. And Hunter is dealing with some stuff that other people might know about. Again, this is, this is something that you might not share with, with everybody. It's private. But it affects you. The visualizations were, um, were animated. Um, they were hyperlocal. And the idea here is that if you bring something down from the abstract to what's it going to do to your car that's in the parking lot? What's it going to do, you know, to if your dorm gets flooded, your laptop is not something that you can replace because you don't have any money to replace it with. So these are the sort of very specific and hyperlocal sorts of animations that we provided people in what we're calling the the um, the experimental group. Everybody else saw the, just your standard broadcast and these folks saw the visualizations. And here's a depiction of one of the animations. Throughout the course of the narration, we saw the hurricane approaching and becoming more and more of a threat. And as part of that threat was what we really wanted to focus on, which was storm surge flooding. And this little visual is not animated, of course, but it gives you a sense and it gave the participants a sense of, oh my God, this is what it could be. And there we were seeing, you know, what, what really differential impact can this kind of approach have? So we have the narration, we have the visualization for half of the participants, and we have an ethical matrix, excuse me, ethical matrix, which is something that everybody participated in. I mentioned they had the first breakout groups that were just character specific. And then later on, we had mixed breakout groups where um, all the characters were put together in a particular you know, suite of breakout groups. And they filled out this thing called the ethical matrix. A little bit of background on the ethical matrix to, to sort of round out what I offered earlier is that this is um, an ethics-based discussion tool. You think about um, philosophy like Rawls, his, um, his philosophy, his approach to um, ethics is a basis for the ethical matrix. It is also in line with what we do for um, consideration of human subjects. The IRB needs for, for um, care and concern and appropriate treatment of people we do our experiments or our, our, our explorations with. This is reflected in the ethical matrix. Basically, we ask people to come together and say, from your character's perspective, what's going on? The first step is something called a values matrix. And again, using Hunter as the example, 
Hunter has the same needs that everybody has, needs for well-being, autonomy or freedom and justice. People deserve fair treatment, that's justice. So while there's a lot to read on this slide, the essence of it is that, you know, Hunter needs to be safe. Um, that's not so easy for Hunter. Hunter needs to um, contend with the fact that there's a disability that others may or may not be aware of. And then justice is like, well, you know, wh what do I do? How does this, this crisis look for me if this hurricane hits? With the facilitators in the breakout groups, we put together what's called a consequences matrix, which basically lists all the participants, all the stakeholders in the left-hand vertical column. Here, I just represent Hunter again. And the consequences matrix basically says, we have all these people with values and needs, and maybe a lot of them weren't apparent in the first instance. So how do we, how do we come together when we need to make decisions together as a community or as you know people who live on campus? And especially, you know, what if people who are in that community are more or less vulnerable in certain ways? How do we elucidate that? That doesn't always get reflected. So what did we find? We had um, two looks at this. First of all, we um, we did publish a paper that was descriptive, and we have just submitted a quantitative paper with um, specific questions that we wanted to really, really explore. But what's important to take away, I think, is that we did achieve what we wanted. The workshop appeared to be associated, overall, the workshop itself appeared to be associated with increasing feelings of worry. And the thing that's important there is it wasn't fear, it was worry that was um, connected to intent, intent to take protective action. And the discussing the matrix did affect people's understanding of what things meant for people for themselves and for others. And we were a little surprised that we didn't see a difference in the two groups between the standard visuals and the immersive hyperlocal visualizations. And we have some thoughts about that going forward. But overall, and I'll show this on the next slide, what was really intriguing is that people's perspectives seem to be broadening to be a little bit more inclusive of what other people had going on. And here are just two quotes. And this was reflected not just in an analysis of the comments, but it showed up in, in the statistics statistical analysis as well. So in looking ahead, and the team is continuing to, to do this exploration, and you can see, this is just me. I've titled this slide, Community Engaged Research for Actionable Science, because this is what, this is my passion. Um, engaging with communities in ways that help surface all of these needs, all of these um, values and the, um, the, the effort to ensure that not only do people really understand in a visceral way on an emotional level as well as a cognitive level, what we're contending with <clears throat> in this situation, in this context, and you know, in a lot of other contexts that are um, the subject of, of science investigations and, and hopefully science-based solutions. The, um, the need to engage with stakeholders and understand their perspectives and then connect 
those perspectives to good outcomes on an individual and collective level is, is really important. So we are in the process of, of um, doing more work and the visualization effort involves folks at the reality deck. Thank you guys for all your work. Um, it's been so fun and we've learned a lot, but what happens if at the reality deck, maybe in, in you know, the future with other sort of um, web-based or, or, you know, handheld tools, whatever, maybe, I don't know, ultimately on a cell phone, people can look at um, and visualize effects and do their own sorts of explorations, you know, well, what are the evacuation routes? Um, who lives where? You know, I mean, um, there are certain neighborhoods who have, have really just had to just absolutely claw back after previous disasters. And then, you know, hospitals, you can think of a bunch of things like where where are the elderly living? And, you know, how does that fit in? And then secondly, in addition to keeping on looking at what helps people feel and act on, <clears throat> excuse me, um, science-based knowledge, we're really interested in <clears throat> the ethical matrix as a tool that can be used in a lot of different circumstances to help people say, okay, here's what I thought we were dealing with, but now here's what we're really dealing with. And let's be inclusive of everybody's needs to the extent that we can. And let's be representative in how we ask and answer the questions we have before us, whether that's related, related to storm surge flooding or, um, you know, maybe um, where to site and how many um, cooling centers to put into a certain metropolitan area. So these things are important. Principles of well-being, autonomy, and justice are, are not just uh, intellectual sorts of things to consider. And there we go. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, really nice presentation. Um, I, uh, before, while we're uh, doing questions, one thing I failed to mention in the beginning, I was looking at my notes and cross-eyed, I guess. But yeah, Julia, after her PhD, did, was at the Alan Alda Center here at Stony Brook for a couple of years. And that's how she knows some of the folks here and was a postdoc there for a couple of years. And I failed to mention that happened before she went over to the EPA uh, and so forth. So yeah, Julia allotted some time here for discussion. Um, you know, this topic, I'm guessing... Uh, uh, involves some of you out there in terms of your work and communicating that work out to the to the masses and and how people take action. So I'm gonna ask for any questions out there. Who wants to be the first? Joseph, what did I miss? Nothing. I, I I thought it was really good. It, it's interesting to see someone else present on the work that we've worked on because I've been mostly presenting it. But I think you did a really good job. Oh, thank you. I wasn't fishing, but no, I no, I know you weren't. I just yeah. I don't know. I liked the um the fire example like in a building because I really like can envision that really well where it's like you know you hear a fire alarm go off and if you're the only one that like starts moving you're gonna second guess and be like I'm not gonna you know you're yeah. looking for those visual cues of other people which is really interesting so so Julia um I mean one thing if we have time I I'm wondering if folks may have a question about exactly during the workshop, how the ethical matrix worked, you know, in terms of step by step. I mean, if you, if, since we have a little few minutes, I mean, just thinking about people in the room, the breakout room, filling out that matrix mm -hmm. uh, with their own, with their character, 
and then kind of what happened? I mean, what what was kind of the protocol there to kind of flesh out what you were describing with, you know, the appreciation of needs? And yeah, so um, and I would invite Susan to jump in here too, because Susan is the um, the person who brought this tool to the team. the The process is this: um, we we had two breakout groups. during the course of the online um, workshop. And as I mentioned, the first group was, okay, let's get all on the same sort of landscape about who is this character? What is this person dealing with? What, are this per what is this person um, considering in this context? And um, they all um, filled out a values matrix together. And they were they were given direction. Actually, Susan did, did a great job of, of helping people understand, briefed everybody up on the ethical matrix and how it worked. And, and then they, in their respective groups, put together this values matrix for their particular character. And then there was a very necessary break. And um, when we came back, each facilitated breakout groups with all the mixed characters the, the facilitators help put together what's called the consequences matrix. And the consequences matrix really just brings it all together. And you have everybody represented in this grid and everybody's need for well being, autonomy, and justice or fairness. And everybody's concern is in that matrix. It changes things, what you talk about, the trade offs. Um, it, it's kind of enlightening. I mean, I've seen the way Susan's used it in her class for different questions, and it brings to the surface things that you may not have understood because everybody only has one life. And as much as we've tried to be a part of the, you know, the social questions that we're all facing, we have one life. And so I may not understand what, you know, somebody, somebody else is going through. And so the consequences matrix is, is then the, the deliberative kind of tool that people use to say, here's what we could do to build community resilience. Here's what we could do in taking these steps. Here's what we can do to prioritize, prioritize this or that. And um, it has potentially a number of different applications. I mean, I, I work a lot with our um, environmental justice office at EPA. And I would love to do a workshop with those guys. There's a lot, there's a lot of richness to be brought to the debate about environmental justice using this tool, just as another example. Edith, what are your thoughts? I think that's a great idea. Um, I, I was thinking about um, the the different the different ways that you can use the ethical matrix. Our example in our pre our workshop that we did online with the students, everyone was a person. Um, but as as you look at examples of ethical matrices that have been applied, um, sometimes that uh, those affected are not even necessarily humans, um, right? Maybe they're groups of people or maybe they are things like, um, I was looking at one the other day and biodiversity was a factor to be considered because that decision would affect biodiversity. Um, you know, in the in the framework that they were looking at. And so I think it's interesting to think as a facilitator how to encourage people to think about everything that will be impacted. Um, and that sometimes there is the ability to engage with stakeholders. And, um, you know, no one can question biodiversity and say, hey, biodiversity, you know, how might this affect you? Um, and so the it, I think it also has a great utility in helping people um, consider those different perspectives, even when they're not necessarily accessible. Although I think there, there are ethical concerns with speaking for or going on my assumption about what I think a certain group, stakeholder group might need. Uh, I love this. And and there's um, there's the, a, a burgeoning um, area of exploration out of Australia actually called multi-species justice. And it's just that. It's like, well, how do we extend the boundary of moral consideration to non-human nature? And it's complicated, but you know, you may not come to 
an ethical matrix discussion saying, okay, I'm, I'm seagrass. But there are people who study seagrass and say, this is, this is a consideration from the perspective of, of this entity that makes up this, this fabric of this world. Right. Brian, you want to take on the question in the chat? Yeah, I, I was going to say, let's uh, talk a little bit about the imagery. Um, there was a question about the, the no difference in response between the forecast and, and the visualization. And, and, and once again, I, I just to give kind of, you might want to give a like play by play how those forecasts were given, even in the standard graphical way. Our, you know, our student Joseph, for example, was heavily involved in that uh, delivery and stuff so so but yeah the question is why little difference between the 3d visualization and the and the standard forecast just if you can speak to better do you mind we don't have a definitive answer we have um some theories um it wasn't like we asked people like well why didn't it work you know we didn't get a chance to ask that but that's also why we're doing more follow-up but i think some of the the theories could be you know maybe it wasn't realistic enough that's a thing where if you don't connect with it, it doesn't really impact you. Um, and I think maybe because we did college students, and this is my own personal theory, is that maybe it looked too much like a video game. And if you're doing with, you know, college students who who have wide experiences with video games, it might not click. It might still be like, this is not real. I know this is a fantasy. This is a computer generated image. If I did this with my grandma, and that's the example I always give, she would be terrified out of her mind because she, you know, doesn't have that experience with, you know, computer generated images. So, you know, I think that that could have played a factor. Um, maybe it wasn't realistic enough. I can't remember what else we said in the paper. Well, uh, we also said that you did a really really good job as the student meteorologist and you were really relatable. And so there may have been a ceiling effect there. Yeah, that was the other one. Also, you know, 11 and a half meters, terrifying. So we, you know, we may have basically said, evacuate. And so there wasn't a, a real, you know, distinction between the two comparison groups. Yeah, the, the hope was that the people who saw the visualizations um, would evacuate perhaps like the day before the people who didn't. Um, and we saw absolutely no difference between, you know, who evacuated on day five versus three versus two between the two groups. You know, we had like a lot of people evacuate two days before. And that was probably because of stuff that was said in the narrative. Um, but yeah, it wasn't like, it wasn't what I expected, at least, where it was like day five, people who saw the visualization got it before the people who didn't receive the visualizations when it clicked. Let's bring our minds back to that that now nefarious and unforgettable ranking question. Remember, we yeah. asked people to rank what the influences were for their decisions to evacuate, and the visualization was up there. Mm -hmm. But we just didn't see a statistical, dis you know, difference, and so it's kind of tantalizing, and we're going to look into it some more. Great, thank you both. Hi, Any this other? is Karina. I had a question. Yeah, go for it, Karina. <clears throat> yeah, thanks so much for your talk. Um, really great. Um, were you able to um, do a survey on if? they had dealt with extreme events before, before they took the, um, you know, the exercises. I'm just wondering if that would influence how they would respond if they had dealt with an extreme event before or not. Yeah, we did. That was part of the survey. And, and you know, that has been, okay, this is not my area of expertise, so I should be more, more careful in saying things that, or just my opinion, but you know, as as you know, Karina, there's a lot of reason to believe that that would be the case for, based on the literature search that, that we just did, um, and we also found that there, in, this didn't appear in the, the manuscript, but there was a gender factor too. 
So it was, you know, really interesting. And, and we did find that there was an association. Yeah, I'd be interested in that gender factor as well. I think that would definitely be something that plays in. Yeah, the women were more responsive. Yeah. That's been shown. Yeah. <laughs> Look at Nancy. Mm -hmm. What is it? White man syndrome or something like that? Is that what it's called? I don't remember. Um, Aaron McCrite from Michigan State has the cool dudes paper about how there's a gender difference when it comes to risk. His is his interest is in climate change. I do want to say one last thing about the ethical matrix, if I may. Sure. Please. Um, I think um one of the good things about the tool is that it's not so much whether you're making the right decisions i think a lot of it is the process you know um when you're going into it and considering all of the things you know you might have like a list of five things that you know to make it concrete but you know it's the process of thinking about, well, how does that affect biodiversity? How does that affect um, X, Y, Z, people who live there, people who don't live there? It's that process that is eye-opening and gets you closer to just better decision-making, even though the output of the tool might not be, you know, the the full answer i'm not explaining this well but it's it's the process that is like the most important part of this where it's you have to consider so much and i think just that appreciation of wow there's a lot of stuff to consider is really yeah. eye opening outside of that space where in your everyday life you're like well maybe that would affect this person differently and you might not have considered that beforehand so i think it's more process driven than what is the result of the consequence matrix? Great, thank you, Josie. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I don't. I think many of us have been involved in decision making, uh, even New York City and so forth, where there just ends up being a workshop or a, a meeting, board meeting, or some kind of meeting where there's a topic on the table and it's kind of a random discussion with a few voices leading it. So as Joseph's suggesting, this may be a, an organized way of getting the issues on the table and getting people to interact and understand those issues as opposed to kind of a, a conversation that could you know, go in various directions. Um, any, uh, any other thoughts or questions about uh, uh, Julia's presentation today? Where would you like to see the ethical matrix applied? I, wow, there are so many ways. I've already mentioned, you know, test driving it with the people in our Office of Environmental Justice. Um, I think that would be really interesting and really strategic because then it'll be the design that we wanted, right? How do you help people take this tool and, and put it to broader and more impactful use. Um, there are so many um, so many situations. I mean, my first really immersion in difficult issues was Everglades restoration a long, long time ago. And you've heard me gripe about this, Joseph. It was really difficult people had deep animus and so much bitterness that they just didn't even trust people to, to, to engage with. And taking a tool like this and, and making it an even sort of playing field for people to put in their needs and their values, um, I, think, I think it's a way forward. And there are plenty of those really difficult, complicated, multi-layered issues out there. Yeah. Anyhow, I uh hey Brian, do you have 
Dr. Donitz questioned. I think you uh, might be the is there one I met. Oh, there is. Uh, it just popped up. I didn't see. It. Um, uh, 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 yeah. So, what was Susan's um, you know, motivation for suggesting the ethical matrix um, effectively? And how did how did it even come up? I guess is what Dominic is asking here. And was it shown to be effective in other workshops? We're not aware of it being utilized before in this kind of a workshop context. And um, I don't know how Susan first discovered it. You know, Susan's just innate curiosity, probably. There is a manual um, that was published in 2006, right? That we um, are able to use, Dominic. I don't know if you found that yet. That was published by a group out of the Hague, is that what I'm remembering inside the Hague? I don't know those, we didn't know uh, the UK that. somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Um, where they wrote up, you know, how to, how you might use um, the ethical matrix. So I know, I know she was familiar with that. I think she pulled that in. Um, is she still on this call? No. I think she, she had, had to call. leave. She yeah. also did, I had, I got to visit. Um, so I remember it. Um, she taught a freshman seminar um, when we were beginning this work, uh, where she had her undergrads um, in the seminar um, employ the ethical matrix to different um, different topics, sort of, of driven by their interest. Um, so I know she also did that that same semester, um, which is years ago now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But Dominic, yeah, I've had that same question to Susan of how did you make that leap from initially bioethics to, you know, whether decision making, but I think it's just a good tool for any decision making, you know, like it doesn't matter the context that it, it can be useful. So I don't know why she yeah. suggested it, but I'm glad she did because I think it is is useful and we've kind of found that to be true so far. Okay. Well, I think we're going to wrap this up. It's one o'clock here. So I'd like to thank Julia again for her presentation and and, uh, and so forth. So uh, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining here uh, today and so forth. Um, and so uh, have a great day, everyone. Thanks again, Julia. Great presentation. Nice to see you, you guys. Julia. Thanks so much. Yeah.